Alan Fullman's work resides between the fields of sound, art, and music. Since 1981, Fullman has developed a long string instrument, an installation of dozens of wires, 50 feet or more in length. In our case, it's about 71 feet. Uh, tuned in just intonation and bowed with rosin-coated fingers, producing a chorus of minimal organ-like overtones. The instrument combines Fullman's artistic expressions of everyday activities, such as walking, with a unique performance art, art sensibility. Please join me in welcoming Alan Fullman.
something like first-hand experience, you know. So I wanted you to have that before we started to talk about my ideas and um, how I came to this point. Um, one thing I wanted to uh, describe to you um, uh, as far as what happened there, if you noticed, um, my right hand position remained the same the entire time. And um, there's a curious thing about how this works, uh, just, you know, literally through, you know, walking and walking and walking um, year after year, day after day, hour after hour, um, I started to notice that um, I could change the um, overtone spectrum of a co a, an existing chord by choosing different tones to play with it. And uh, um, if you, uh, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but um, um, it, it occurred there that I, I um, changed, you know, to another note um, there about halfway down and I lifted off and it, it was as if there was a different chord being played. You heard like so many different transformations along the way. Um, um, so it's, it's a mysterious, you know, wonderful thing to, to play with, around with, with the, um, what this instrument does with um, uh, extended, um, very strong high partials. I mean, that's a, a harmonic um, upper partial tones. Um, that's um, the material that I work with and what intrigues me um, about this particular thing. And um, um, so it's, it's a very technical thing, but, it's, but I, I hope you, you heard what I'm talking about. Um, um, and um, well, I'll go back to that and, and um, point out some things, but um, I'm gonna go way back to the beginning. Um, when I first started playing with um, materials as a sculptor, um, I went to the Kansas City Art Institute. Um, in my um, final year, um, I became interested in sound. I became aware of the work of Harry Parch, who was um, um, one of the um, great exper American experimentalists who was born at the turn of the century and whose work reached a zenith, you say, in the mid, early 60s. Um, California-based, and he um, invented, well, he studied, you know, Greek, ancient Greek music theory, and um, was the, a revivalist of um, uh, the tuning, the tuning systems that um, they invented, I would say, like in, in Greece and China, simultaneously, the, um, what we refer to as Pythagorean tuning. Um, um, and he, he took that further, and I'll, I'll go into that, but it's, it gets kind of technical, just that it's all based on mathematical intervals. But um, anyway, so I first became aware of his work, and that made me interested in sound. Well, I was, I was interested before, um, um, but that becoming aware of his work gave me the impetus to pursue making my own instruments, and this was my first instrument was the metal skirt sound sculpture. Um, also, um, at this time, I um, was, and still am, really fascinated by the, the Judson Church um, group in New York, the uh, artists in the mid-60s who were um, creating dance performance works, um, Yvonne Rayner, Tricia Brown, um, and a large influence on me, Deborah Hay. Um, these artists were incorporating everyday movement into their work, and I like the idea of that. Um, and it, with this piece, um, I really liked the idea that all I had to do was walk, and I could create a spectacle of myself, and as well as um, create a very odd sound. What um, I had were. Um, guitar strings, kind of, you know, elastic nylon core strings, um, the toes and heels of my platform shoes, and I, I put, um, I, I built big um, uh, bridges on the, sh on the front and back of the shoes. Um, this was 1980 in the disco era. It just, um, 
coming to a demise, and there were lots of um, platform shoes in Goodwill. Um, so um, I put these strings to the toes and heels of my shoes, and I felt kind of like puppet-like um, with the strings. And well, what happened was when I stretched one leg forward, the back string stretched out and produced a rising gliss, while the front string squeezed in and produced a descending gliss. So simultaneously, it was rising and falling pitches as well as a lot of metal creaking. Um, I I'll put a, um, a um, contact microphone on the um, skirt and carried a pig nose amp over my shoulder. And this is a, a videotape from that time of me walking down the street on Hennepin Avenue in Minneapolis, where I lived. Um, that this was um, the area um, where the uh, prostitutes work, and hence I named this piece Streetwalker. fourth wall there, but I didn't succeed. Um, so at that time, I, I, you know, I just like intuitively worked with materials and just wanted to, to, want to play with things. And um, this was in my, my loft studio. I made this um, pedal that I could jump, and down, jump up and down on and shake a lot of um, uh, metal litho plates. Um, so that's, that's how the, um, yeah, I was, um, I strung up one string, I put, uh, Ten coffee cans on either side of the, of it, and created like a child's walkie-talkie telephone. I sang into it, um, recorded at the other end. It was like a kind of a analog filter for my voice. I bowed the string, um, and then one day I I brushed it past the, past this string where the rosin had been deposited by the bow, and it produced this whole other kind of sound. And I just started to explore that. I um, then attached that string to a very large uh, mixing bowl, put some water in it, um, put the contact pickup on the bowl, modulated the sound of the resonance of the bowl by kind of playing that string and, and resonating the bowl. But I was very confused because I was not able to tune the string. Um, and no matter what I did, you know, tensioning it, um, didn't change the pitch, so it was, it was just a very mysterious thing until um, I met up with um, 
Bob Balecki, who's an engineer. Um, he's teaching at Bard now um, in the MFA program, and um, but he's uh, who's a uh, very creative engineer who has influenced a lot of um, composers' work. Um, Lamont Young, um, Laurie Anderson, he invented uh, Laurie Anderson's tape bow violin, among many other things that she has worked with. And uh, I was able to have a meeting with him, and he explained this um, to me. Um, told, he, he brought a, um, the handbook of physics. He brought a spool of brass wire. He brought a uh, vice grip. And um, so he told me that, that this string was vibrating in the longitudinal mode. Um, the, the wave is moving back and forth along the length because I'm rubbing it along the length. I'm exciting that mode in the string as opposed to the transverse mode, which is like an up and down wave, uh, which is uh, created when you pluck or bow across. Um, and so he clamped the vice grip on the wire, and that produced a higher pitch. Then we um, attached the, a brass wire um, and stretched it, and then that, that, is, that as well put, produced a lower frequency. So the only way um, to tune um, wires that are vibrating in the longitudinal mode is by changing the length or by changing the material um, of the wire. Um, the um, first installation I did after that meeting with him was at the Terminal New York show in Brooklyn in 1983. Um, this was a uh, show organized uh, by the first wave of Williamsburg artists. Uh, there were 600 artists in the show. It was um, in um, what was the um, U.S. Uh, postal, it was like an army terminal, but taken over by the a post office. It had a railroad track running through it. It was like a mile-long uh, concrete building, and um, I just set up my studio there. Um, I brought a bunch of wood. I built a wooden box resonator. I decided I, I wanted to, I was interested in, in, in acoustic sound. Um, and so this was my first tuned instrument. And this tape, this videotape represents the first time that I explored this installation. that it was a, kind of a theremin-like experience of just touching and having these sound, these like beautiful kind of uh, like chamber, um, like it's like a string quartet almost, just it's very intuitive and just, just touching and, and uh, so I was just very excited about the potential there. Um, and, uh, but I, I needed to teach myself basic principles about music, like how, about, you know, tuning and, and harmony and musical structure. Um, I have a bunch of technical slides here. Um, I think I might be best to kind of zoom through this and not worry too much whether we, you know, you know, really, you know, um, get every detail here. Um, but this is my world. This is, um, I, I work with um, ratio-based tuning. Um, that's a diagram there that shows, say, two strings of equal length. That E string has 
a clamp or a capo placed on it two-thirds of the way down. Um, in that case, um, if the first, if the string length is at the pitch A and you clamped a capo two-thirds of the, of the way, you would get um, the pitch E. And that's, um, in musical terms, that's the most harmonic relationship after the octave, which is, it's called the perfect fifth in, um, you know, uh, Western, um, Western classical theory. And, but actually that relationship is um, the number three. Um, it's, and in just intonation, um, it's referred to as the three over two. Um, and there it is again, just showing the math of how ratios are um, calculated. And then this is a tool that I use, it's called the tuning lattice. This is, you know, this is like a universal kind of tool. It's not something that I invented. It's, um, it's something that um, helps me navigate through pitch relationships. Um, if you calculate as I do the tuning system based on A and call that A um, your one over one, that would be your root, and then um, the three over two, then the perfect fifth. Um, if you diagram those as um, along a horizontal axis, and then the next most harmonic relationship is if you divided, say, that string up into five parts, then four fifths of that length equals the major third. And I've diagrammed that um, on the diagonal. And this lattice can just go on and on. You just, it's building relationships of relationships. You keep going. And this is how just intonation works. It's all like, it's all mathematical, um, mathematically based and uh, it's a network um, of an interval of an interval of an interval, um, pure intervals. Um, but in that case, when you, when you work with these pure intervals, um, as opposed to equal temperament, which is what all of our Western classical music is tuned to, where there are 12 equally placed notes in an octave, in this case, it's your choice how many notes you want in an octave. And you run into issues where you might have several versions of a, of a tone. Like for example, you see the, the G um, nine over five up in the right corner is plus 17.6 cents. Cents is, is like a unit of measurement between, there are 100 cents between each half step. Um, the 16 over nine G is minus 3.9 cents. So those two Gs are slightly out of tune with each other. Um, and so you run into issues of, you know, having a whole lot of notes in a scale or, um, you know, uh, just deciding, you know, like where, where to limit your musical material. Um, I kind of meander through um, these ratios and just explore different areas at different times. Um, different intervals, different combinations of intervals. And this is a mapping of Harry Parch's 43-tone uh, scale. He defined his, his scale and, and didn't deviate. He's, he stayed within this, which has a, it has a beautiful symmetry and lots of different possibilities. Um, this is um, William Matthews. Um, diagram interpreting that lattice for um, musicians who are used to uh, staff notation. So he's, he's turned it on its side and so that, that makes that, um, those kind of relationships more clear for people with um, standard training. Uh, this is a, a spread out of a book published at the turn of the century by John Tyndall, it's called Sound. And this is, this is uh, uh, an experiment where he shows these principles of the longitudinal mode and how the string vibrates um, when excited in the longitudinal mode. So, the, so the, um, 
this principle was, was well known um, in musical acoustics, but to my knowledge was never used uh, for a musical instrument. And Bob told me that the speed of the wave divided by the length will give the frequency. So I, I plugged that formula into an Excel spreadsheet. And if you see that like in the, those colored areas, you've got brass, bronze, stainless steel up at the top. And then those are different lengths um, in metric, um, metric units. Um, so what I do is I just stretch out a tape measure and then I place these these capos, um, you know, basically at these locations, but then I use an electronic tuner to fine tune it. This is my first score. Um, I wanted to find a way to define time and compose music for this instrument, which is, um, you know, where time is um, really all about walking, about how far the performer, um, the distance of, of each, you know, how, how long a tone is, is sustained, sustain the duration. Um, standard notation just uh, seemed to make no sense uh, for this, and this, this instrument wants to have tones that extend for a long duration because of the changes which take place, you know, as the performer moves. Um, that's, that's the beauty, uh, you know, I feel of, of this and the interesting part to explore. So, um, so anyway, I, this was in 1984, I, I, I thought, well, you know, how can two people keep, say a, this is a duet, how can two people keep track of each other? Um, the only way I could think of, you know, first thought was in unison. The two walked together. So we walked to the bridge at the resonator and walked out together and played these, this sequence of chords. And this um, piece was a duet composed for myself with composer Arnold Dreiblatt. Arnold has been a big um, influence on my work. I really, I really um, am very interested in, in his music. Um, then I thought, well, what's the next most complex way that two people could still track each other um, and I thought of this where one person is walking out while the other one is walking in. And what was nice about this was that um, each performer could kind of cover over the others, the blank space where the performer changed to a new chord. When the other performer could continue sustaining and then, and then they, could, they crossed over each other and kind of like a scissor-like motion. But I didn't want to stop with that, um, I wanted to be able to track multiple performers in a more complex way. I saw this fabric, this, and this Guatemalan fabric just somehow, you know, uh, read as music to me. The geom geometric patterns just inspired me. And I came up with this system where I placed colored lines on the floor, and these lines were at um, proportionate intervals to each other. And that way, uh, the performers were able to track more complex changes. Um, this, I have a video of, of that piece.
soul. That was a real landmark for me, and I'm still very excited about working with multiple people moving uh, in that way. Uh, that piece I distilled to a duet uh, with Danielle Massey, one of, one of the performers in the video. And we were, um, we were uh, performing in Seattle at Soundworks uh, Northwest. And after the show, we were in a, a, a warehouse space uh, for the Frick Art Museum downtown Seattle. And um, we recorded after the concert um, and something happened that changed things for me or really added something and, and, and what happened was a train came by and uh, the sound of the train I'll let you hear it The sound of that train, uh, I, I wanted to incorporate that kind of a sound into my music, and I, I just thought that that moment when that train came by was more beautiful than the piece that I had composed. It's just the com combination was beautiful. And um, what I wanted to do was to be able to compose works that also produced that kind of sound. Um, and what I realized is that I needed to expand, well, let me just say that um, this project has been my own personal music school, and I started with the most simple intervals and incorporated those or uh, internalized, you know, those, those relationships, and over time, what I've been doing is expanding outward toward more dissonant or more complex intervals, and that's what the train did. It was, uh, there was uh, more uh, complexity in that sound and um, you know, what you might call dissonance, but the, uh, like I feel a beautiful expressivity in that. And uh, so I wanted to, um, I didn't know, I, I didn't, you know, I, I, it took me a long time, like, you know, I just kind of, try different things and, uh, you know, to, to get that going. Um, well, I think, I think what, I'm, what I want to do is just play one more track. This is, this is when I started to feel like I, that I was, I was getting something there with, with that. Uh, this, this piece, I, I titled it Train um, because, uh, you know, the relationship of, to that other moment. Uh, this was recorded um, in Berlin. Uh, I was there on a DAAD fellowship for a year in 2000, 2001. And I, I was, it was there that I, I started exploring more extended 
intervals. So there's, you know, um, I think every artist has like a lot of like different areas of, of interest. Um, that's, that's one area. Um, and then um, this graph here uh, describes what I was talking about earlier, which had to do with those um, extended partials and the kind of things that can happen when, when that's there. Um, this is a comparison between my instrument and a cello, uh, both playing um, A. And you can see down in the lower range, um, the cello is, is blue, the long string instrument is yellow. And there's a lot of overlap down in the low frequencies. Um, but as you move up um, in the higher range, um, um, in the, in the middle there, you see that um, the partials on the long string instrument remain very, very strong and continue up beyond the so-called range of hearing, which is supposed to be 20K. But these partials are um, very strong up in the um, like 30, 40K. So I suspect that there are things going on with like super, you know, like high frequencies that maybe we can't really even hear and then things going on with um, when chords are played and they're and all the every string has like a spectrum like so intense that that these upper frequencies are batted around and influenced by each other because there's just so much going on up there and that's kind of that's that's what I play with that's that's and I, I like to um, try and have succeeded sometimes, I like to try to map out these changes, which, you know, to, to locate something and be able to, um, to uh, pull it back again uh, through composition. So this is just a graphic to describe like this, all these um, the spectrum changes along the length. These, this um, kind of spiky um, 
elongated thing is re represents like the harmonics along a string length. I, um, just some of the harmonics, you know. It's um, just as a way for me to visualize that. And my strings are all different lengths. They stop at these clamps. And I, I, this chart is shows the resonator on the left, and this this is an example of a chord tuned to the uh, these first few harmonics. Um, it's a very harmonic overtone series based chord. Um, and then I've got the, I stretched the graphic out the, to different lengths. Um, the, you'll notice the number, circled numbers on the floor are, are represented there along the top axis. And then you see that there, the patterning lines up for some, um, some of those points. And that's when I hear what I call um, events or um, artifacts. You hear like these changes which occur along the length of the string, the, the spectral changes. This is a diagram which is based on this elastic band that I have um, hanging on the installation here. I have um, these colors um, that are they're banded at, at different, um, um, say, intervals. Um, they're like dividing this length up into uh, the first few overtones. You uh, divided the elastic into three. Uh, into um, five, seven, and nine, and then each one is a different color. So the roots are, are the root is pink. The root is the um, like the octave and fundamental. Um, and I have here these these um, the paper. I can see the stretches. It's just a last band, and, and it's colored here. This rainbow area here is the halfway point. And this, um, so I've been um, kind of visualizing what's going on here by hanging these, you know, and then I, as I play, and it's like, oh, okay, I passed that across the, you know, the nine, you know, or passed across the, the three, the, the five. Um, and you can really hear a lot here with the halfway point because it's kind of like it all comes together. Um, but I've got this set up just this string is D, and uh, if you can, can listen to what happens when I reach that. right here, that's this, the a, this A string. So it almost, it cancels out, kind of goes silent there. But when I play this, the two strings together, this one, this is the, the nine and the three, um, which lines up, because these are, these are, this is a perfect fifth relationship the, between the, it, this A is the A above D. And when uh, when the strings are tuned like in these uh, proportionate ways, you know these events are going to line up with each other. If it's the same, the string is made out of the same material, which this is. This is these are both stainless steel. So let's um, listen to what happens when. So there's, you know, those two things happening. 
this is um, my most um, precise notation to date. Um, it's a, a solo piece, and I used the, the circular number, the numbers with circles on the floor to mark, you know, locations where, where to be walking to, and um, I designed um, graphic icons to remind myself of different um, gestural um, articulations. Um, and so it's really like a, a road map uh, telling me where to go and um, I have some video of that piece. Um, and for this piece, I mounted spy cams on my wrists, um, which show um, my the what what I would call micro articulations of my fingertips, which change the the sound um, being produced. And my idea was to uh, share with the audience who, you know, uh, like at a distance or whatever, you would just see hands, you know, uh, kind of not doing very much. But then I, I thought, well, I'll bring the audience in to like little things that I'm doing with my fingers. Um, and um, what I ended up with looks a little bit like dancing spiders because it's a, I projected these very large um, in a performance um, at the Berkeley Art Museum. Um, and the, there's, so there's the two images side by side and it's just static, like two hands um, and because the, the relationship between the camera and the hands is, is static and then you just, you see the floor sweeping by.
And finally, um, I have a folk music bent. And <laughs> I always wanted to find a way to um, play my instrument rhythmically without feeling embarrassed about having this gigantic thing um, and you know playing something that might you know could easily be played on better and better on a on a cello or a violin or something. Um, so uh, I've I've worked through the years um, with uh, working with different tools, or just pieces of wood and um, exploring things, but nothing seemed to work quite to my satisfaction and. I did touch you know, strings with my, my palms of my hand um, with a rocking motion, and I came up with the idea of, of making something to hold kind of like an iron that is with, uh, with a curve that's kind of based on the curve of the palm of the hand. And I, I um, made a model of this um, when I was in Berlin, and fortunately um, I had uh, an instrument builder friend there, uh, Stefan Beck, and he, he um, made these for me. They're hollow wooden boxes. The wood is, you know, a, a nice resonant wood like uh, California redwood or something, and I um, applied rosin to the box. And uh, I'm going to zoom on. This is, um, these are some graphics that I use to describe different articulations, and it's really a lot like Conga drum playing. It's like slapping and and you know cup you know motions like that. Um, there's a you know it's possible to dampen and to play an open tone. And so I came up with this notation and put it in a grid. Um, decided to make a piece in four four time. Um, I invited a couple of um, students from Mills graduate students from Mills College to uh, play with me. And you know at first I thought oh, these people, they can do anything. I'm going to write something really complex rhythmically. And then I thought, well, hey, it's a, it's a, it'll be a new musical instrument for them and a you know, new tool to, to be working with. I'm just going to make the piece in 4-4 four, four time. Um, and that, that tur turns out to be hard enough. composed um, the interlocking parts is I, I created loops and then slid them and, and found, um, just found things that, that interested me. Um, um, this is a performance um, from the Seaholm Power Plant with Travis Weller and Nick Kinney's playing the box bows. Um, and I've got a little audio clip that.
put resonators on both sides? I've tried that. Um, the question was, do I put resonators on both sides? Um, I mean, it's an interesting thought because it's true there, there is sound on the other side. Um, I can resonate these wooden blocks here at the end, and the tuning is, is something that makes some sense. Wise, it's kind of hard to um, how do you terminate the string inside another resonator because these these reson the string is terminated with a with like just a dowel and a loop you know and then here I've got a crank and I've, I'm tensioning it. Um, I'm, tension has no bearing in the uh, longitudinal mode as far as like changing the pitch. It's just that I crank up the tension to the breaking point to increase resonance. Um, so it's kind of it's, I just I thought about it, but it just seemed impractical, you know, and I can get sound out of those blocks, which I do sometimes. Does anyone have some feelings? question. Uh, what kind of wire are you yeah. using? Well, um, uh, this wire, it, I, I am able to custom order it and have it drawn from rods uh, from a company in uh, Connecticut. And uh, the wire, um, it's tempered, you know, um, spring tempered wire. <coughs> Um, and most of it is stainless steel. I just, I came across stainless steel. I was on a residency at the Exportorium, and they just ordered a bunch of different materials for me, and I liked the sound of it. Um, but I also like it because it's 9,000. It's like super fine. Um, 9,000 can be compared to the, what, what's called a slinky E string for electric guitar. It's very flexible, um, the, the highest string on the guitar. Um, but I like stainless. Uh, because it's um, strong and to, to I mean, it's, a, it's just like a really fragile, you know, at this length and everything. And, and so I like the fineness of it because when I'm uh, playing it, that you hear less, uh, less, fr less friction and more tone. Um, and then there, I also have some um, bronze wire um, and bronze will put out a lower frequency for, this, for a given length. If, um, and I use bronze just to get lower. Are they all the same gauge then? Well, uh, it, it's gauge also doesn't, doesn't have influence the tuning whatsoever. I just like experimented to find the finest gauge that was practical without breaking too easily. Um, the bronze, I, I settled on 13,000, so it's a little thicker um, because it's more fragile than the tensile strength on it. Is there a, what's what's the, the breaking strength? What's the breaking point? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Uh, it'd be good. But to someone, yeah. <laughs> you have it all custom made. Then. I have it. I, I just have it drawn into a particular temper. You know, they have medium temper, soft temper, hard temper. Hard temper is kind of too brittle. Um, it's this. You know, it's the same stuff as you would order. You would get from a musical instrument company, piano wire, or whatever. It's just that it can be used industrially, the exact same kind of wire. Yes? What's your process for scoring? I mean, do you sort of improvise first and then like, do go back and... That's what I do. Yeah, I just use my ear. I I just, I look for things that I like. I just I just play and then I, I make a note of it. Um, you know, I don't work the other way around of like marking out, oh, this nodal point is going to be here, and then it'll line up with this other thing. I've tried to do that, but it's it really works for me, just what I hear. It seems like you're, yeah, you're using your body, too. I mean, you, you, I mean, that seems that you are using your body as a, as a memory device, too. Exactly. I internalize. Like, I, I have internalized something about the spectrum, you know, and so I know, like, I'm coming up to this. I'm going to play it a little softer because I like to emphasize what happens here, and it's just kind of, and every every movement of the body is reflected in the sound. So if there were any jerk at all, you would you could hear that. And I, I do jerk on purpose sometimes to kind of emphasize like a dynamic, you know, you know change. But I've learned how to walk very smoothly. I kind of I know I realize that I kind of look like I'm on a conveyor belt. <laughs> So that, that just happened through just doing it. Yeah. 
Is this a typical length? Have you done this? Is, I, I love this length. This is, I've done this several times. This is um, 70 feet or so. It's cello range. I don't quite get all the way down to the low uh, C string on a cello. Um, but I, I like this range. And if I, if I have a longer length, then I would put another person playing it as like a bass part. So that, the question was, was I a musician? And, no, I was a visual artist. I, I you know, I studied a sculpture, you know, and so I really don't know a lot about standard music theory. You know, um, I've taken my own route, and I work with, uh, you know, like this tuning, just intonation tuning system, which really doesn't abide by the same rules as um, uh, the, you know, standard, um, you know, music theory. You know, the, it's, it's a, one builds different kinds of chords, or it's possible to, and, and so you really, the same rules don't apply anyway, so. Um, are there notated pieces that yeah. you sit down well, that's a good question. You know, like it is in a way um, specific because um, that piece, the reverse piece on black, um, that piece um, with the hands, that was uh, composed in my studio, um, which is shorter than this. And so, in a way, it's like a higher frequency, higher range piece. Um, so, I even if I was in a long space, I tuned some strings to that same length because then I would run across those same, these kind of sounds at that same place, you know, what I was expecting. So I, it is, it is mind boggling really to like reproduce things or so, you know, it's, it's kind of a fun problem. <laughs> yes? Um, you as the pitch, I just stick with a the same, you know, tuning system and then if, if a room is longer then that allows me to, you know, bump some strings like down an octave. I would double up those lengths, you know. I like getting as low as possible, getting like a more lower end. And so I, you know, it's kind of arbitrary whether I'm, gonna, if I'm gonna, you know, put something in a lower octave. Um, in a way, I sort of think it doesn't matter because the spectrum, like there's so many high overtones, it's, it's like it kind of, the vo as far as voicing goes, what's called voicing, whether you, you know, play notes in a chord in one octave or another, like that's very important in most instruments, but in this it's like all the overtones are just, you know, shimmering around and, I can bump things up and down an octave depending on how softly or hard I, I touch the, the string. And I don't know. Have you tried putting like washers or belts or anything on the strings? Washers? Yeah. Why yeah. would you think of doing that? Well, I guess you'd have to put the wire through the washer. Unless you had the what would split you, what, wires. What, what sound would you I would think? I was wondering if it was like uh, like altered prepared piano where you get different oh, sounds. Like those rattling. Kind of. Yeah, rattling with the bells, maybe with the bells ringing with them. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, yeah. What he asked was, uh, what if you thread a washer through the string through a washer and um, um, to get like kind of a prepared sound, like kind of like a, ra a rattling of the washer or, um, or, or a bell, and, and I said that I haven't, I haven't tried that. Yes. How does flooring or ceiling adjust the performance? I mean, if this yep. room would, it would sound different. Totally different. Totally, yeah. totally. Every room is is so different. Um, you know. It's a matter of kind of, you know, I like to settle in for a few days. It's, it's great here that I get to have these few days um, to just settle in and try to make the most of every situation, um, play the room, you know. It's just, I've been able to experience so many different rooms, you know. Um, 
I mean, that's one thing that's been super great about doing something so enormous is that I have to use large rooms and, you know, so. Uh, Yes. One of the first pieces you did, I said, it was outdoors. Have um, you done? Have you tried doing this okay. outdoors since then? Or? Okay. So uh, the question is about doing it outdoors. Um, what piece are you referring to? The one in Seattle? Uh, the furthest oh, one in New York, I think. No, that wasn't outdoors. It was a building that was like oh. a mile long. It was. It, like it, was, it was an atrium space. Okay. Yeah. No, it wasn't outdoors. I did one installation outdoors um, in Seattle, and it was it was interesting, very interesting. Um, it was on a hillside in Magnuson Park. I have a slide of it. Um, it was my only outdoor installation that was successful. Um, it um, um, and the only reason why it was successful was because oh. I left that slide out. Anyway, but the only reason why it was successful was because the sound engineer was, was really, really great and he put an array of Meyer sound uh, loudspeakers um, around. And the Meyer, uh, I, you know, they just, they're just great um, loudspeakers and he, he kind of made the audience feel like they were in an enclosure. You know, like in, in, I, I really need resonance in a, of a room uh, in order to get these things to happen. Outdoors it just dies away, you know, so. Well, does a stone church? Stone churches are like the primo favorite, yeah. <laughs> favorite place <laughs> for me, yeah. And what were you going to say? Is this the longest one that you worked with? Or it's longer. I worked longer. Um, the, the longest was uh, in uh, Fort Worth. Um, it was on uh, a, uh, uh, it's like in, uh, in a, a barn, uh, like it was a metal uh, building. Uh, it's called the Poultry Barn. It was on the fairgrounds and 300 feet long. I put 300 feet long. I put one string um, and I just attached. It was like a, a metal built, a corrugated metal building. I just attached one string to the corrugate and it had more of a throbbing sound, more of a, 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 a texture or, you know, rather than tonal, more like, I don't know, I, I couldn't really describe it as a, as a tone. But it was, it was fun and I did another, another part that was shorter, you know, where more like this in that space. So, is that everything? Thank you so much.